Gareth Sanford, welcome to the Pace of Performance podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Hey, Rob. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. It's it's nice to um, have a familiar accent. I know that sounds sounds a bit weird, but it's uh, it's nice to speak to an Englishman abroad. So um, yeah, welcome. Thank you, and it's uh, it's nice to say the accent is still there because it's yes. uh, been a little while since I was living living in the UK. So how long how long has it been? Uh, I left the UK in 2015 uh, to move to New Zealand, and okay. then I'm now in Canada. So it's been through the wash a little bit. Yeah, and holding on strong, which is nice. Yeah. It's good. It's good. So anyone that doesn't know who you are, Gareth, would you mind giving us a little bit of a, a background yourself? And there's, there's so much for us to go into today. So a couple of minutes, and then we'll dive straight in. Yep, sounds good. So originally from the UK, uh, from Hertfordshire area, and uh, did a master's and uh, undergrad at Loughborough University in sports science and exercise physiology with a year's placement at Chelsea Football Club. Then did some sprints coaching in the UK, in the US and in India in a tribal community. In 2015, moved to New Zealand and did a PhD there with their Athletics Federation and the Science and Medicine Institute. Part of that involved a six and a half month world tour of uh, middle distance running squads and performance environments which we can get into in a a little while and then in 2018 uh, end of 2018 I moved out to Victoria British Columbia where I'm at at the moment um, where I have a dual role as researcher uh, physiologist um, for Athletics Canada and working with CSI Pacific here the Canadian Sport Institute and University of British Columbia just got back from the Tokyo Games and uh, yeah, exploring what the next option is right now. So yeah, it's been a, a busy couple of months. I bet. Let's talk about this world tour. I'm fasc- I'm fascinated. So that was part of the that was part of the PhD. That's right. That's okay. right. Okay. What was what was the aims of of getting on the road? Yeah. So I guess as a as a kind of overview of of the trip, it was sixty eight thousand kilometers. So that's about one and one and a half times around the world. Um, with eight different nations, 80 coaches, 200 athletes. And the idea was to A, be collecting some PhD data along the way, but also understand um, two of the following questions. So the first one was that I was getting from lots of coaches in this middle distance area. So when I say middle distance, I'm talking about sports in the one to five minute range. So for athletics, that's the 800, the 1500 meters. The two questions I was focusing on was how do we better understand the complexity of athlete profiles that you see in that middle distance event? Meaning some some coaches will have athletes for the 800 that come at it from a speed side of things, so moving up from the 400, and then there are others who will come from the more endurance end, the 800, 1500 types. And then there are some people everywhere in between, and, and coaches have this puzzle of, how do we get the best out of those athletes? So that was that was one question. The second question was, how fast is fast enough in terms of absolute sprinting speed when you're in a sport that equally requires a very high aerobic demand of the athletes? We had a very good idea of, you know, you need a VO2 max of 70 plus or minus, um, but how much sprint speed is enough? And then what are the implications of that with things like the anaerobic speed reserve, which we can get into as we we go through. So that's an overview of, of what we were looking at there. So at what point in your PhD did this trip come around? This towards the start? Yeah, so you had some, sorry, you didn't have any idea of, of what was actually out there or towards the end when you'd kind of started to build up an understanding of what was out there? At the start, you, I guess, do a scope of the area. And uh, it's probably good to point out that the research bias was as follows. You do a a, a journal search for VO2 max, you get 10,000 hits. You search for running economy, you get 3,000 hits. Lactate threshold, 3,000 3, hits. Critical speed, maybe 4,000 hits. Anaerobic speed reserve, when I started, had nine hits. And I think that landscape is important to present because we can run into a trap of what we can measure is all there is. And there are important questions for us on the ground with our sports that we can't really always measure that well, but they're still important. And so what I, I guess, decided to do was look at, okay, well, how can we start to get at that space beyond VO2 max with measures that we can be comfortable, are valid, reliable, have high signal, um, and are easy to capture 
in an elite population. And so the anaerobic speed reserve was, and the maximal sprinting speed being the top end of that, was an easy measure to, to capture. So at the front end, doing that scoping exercise, seeing the, the gap in the, in the area, and then the questions coming from the coaches kind of matching up of, oh, well, maybe if they are seeing this complexity, well, what can represent that? Maybe a, a crude measure of, you know, neuromuscular mechanical capability in terms of sprinting speed as a ceiling, and then maybe the maximal aerobic speed to, to capture that aerobic piece. So explain to us what the anaerobic speed reserve is. You may yeah. have just done that exactly there, sure. but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as a starting point, it's um, it's a speed range. So it's from the maximal aerobic speed, which represents the first speed at which you would hit VO2 max in a laboratory test. Obviously, people using that in the field are doing that without gas analysis, which is why it's different to, say, velocity at VO2 max and can also be used as maximal aerobic power. And it would be seen as more of a performance measure because you aren't uh, directly measuring the gas. Um, and then the maximal sprinting speed, um, I use a 50 meter all out sprint for that from a standing start. Some of that is population specific. So for example, there is data in elite sprinters showing they reach top speed after maybe 60 meters, whereas in maybe junior team sport athletes, it's maybe nearer the 30, 40 meter mark. So there is a population specific constraint on that that top end, but that's that's what the anaerobic speed reserve is. So because there's only nine hits when you when you did that scoping exercise at the start, when you actually got out there in the field on this on this world tour, which sounds absolutely delightful, by the way. Um, obviously, there was work going on in the in the midst of that, but it sounds an yeah. unbelievable experience. Were coaches out there exposing their athletes? to this to anaerobic speed reserve or was it people knew about it but kind of didn't really take any notice i think uh it, it's an it's interesting you ask that question because you know um i think an important thing as a scientist is to meet coaches where they are right sometimes that will be with terminology and other times it won't be and um i wouldn't say anyone was particularly in the, it's certainly in a distance space, looking at speed reserve, where maybe in the in the say four hundred space and and downwards, they and faster they would be. Um, but the idea of how do we get faster on the last lap and how do we understand these differences between individuals were questions that resonate. And to be honest, from as a practitioner, that's the important thing: is does the concept resonate? You know, the terminology can be what it needs to be for it to be meaningful with that that population, as long as, as the scientist you're operating from first principles. And I think that's one of the challenging things that you get in in a space that's maybe relatively underexplored. And and some people would say, well, there's not an evidence base for it. Like, how do you close that gap as a practitioner? And I think there's a few things that enable you to do that with coaches. And I think the first one is you know, having that sport specific context, understanding their their key questions, being open to what those are, and then looking at, okay, well, how do we build from there with scientific first principles? You know, we... God, I'm sorry, I was going to interrupt you then. You saw me going to... Yeah, yeah that's okay. <laughs> sorry, mate, I put you off there. That, so is, is, there, is there any examples of that from other conversations you've had with other sports when it comes to an aerobic speed reserve? Yeah, so I think when... You know, you, you talked before in our pre-talk, we were talking about, you know, some of the stuff I've done with England cricket. And, you know, one of the first things Phil Scott saw when he tried out this was, oh man, this diversity that just plotting the anaerobic speed reserve across my athletes. This is what we've been seeing in training for the last however long, but we've not really had a lens to look at that diversity through. And so I think, that's a good example where some of these simple measures, which maybe in the pure academic scientists don't feel necessarily uh, enough, they feel very simple. But as a first layer, the richness of the discussions that can create are quite extraordinary for people. And that doesn't mean that you have all the answers necessarily once you've identified the diversity. But if there's one thing that people take away from this conversation on anaerobic speed reserve, is to start looking at 
their populations through different subgroup lenses because if you do that, you start asking different questions. Um, and, and if you're not doing that, then I think there's there's things that are being left on the table, which we can maybe un, unpack a bit more. Absolutely. Just taking it back a little bit, I should have asked this sure. right when you mentioned it. So we've got the maximal aerobic speed. That's right. We've got top speed. Yep. Okay, we've collected though we've got those numbers, we've got that data for our squad. What's the next what's the next step in this in this process? Yeah, so another important measure within that is critical speed. And you'll notice that that's not part of the anaerobic speed reserve. Um so to take a step back, there's a, you know, Back in the 1920s, one of the famous physiologists, A.V. Hill, looked at world record performances and he plotted, you know, the 100 meters and the 400 meters and the 10,000 meters and the marathon and looked at the average speed of those races over time, right? And what you get is you get a, a curve that is steepest at the beginning. So the biggest change in that, that speed is from like 100 down to, say, the 5,000 meters. But then once you go 5,000 to the marathon, it kind of tails off. And what I would encourage practitioners to do is to be able to look across that whole intensity speed continuum. Because some sports, for example, like the marathon, are more biased at one end of that, right? At the slower, continuous aerobic area where things like critical speed, really, really critical performance markers then there are some sports like your middle distance sports so sports that fall in the one to five one to ten minutes type space so your rowings your cyclings track and field those kind of things which actually need qualities all the way along that whole spectrum all of the time it's a complete puzzle for coaches because there's so many plates to spin and then you have team sports where they need elements of that stuff at the bottom, but with the increasing high intensity demands and the, the kind of non-high intensity demands at times often being walking, their emphasis is probably more in that top end of that speed duration curve. And what that means is for practitioners that that, that top end is going to have the biggest diversity of profiles because you're getting people approaching that from, from different ends. Now, why that is important from a training application side of things is because some people will start with a model, a training model, like, oh, I use critical speed for programming, or I use the anaerobic speed reserve for programming, or I use, um, you know, a five zone training model that starts at VO2 max and goes down south. And each of those have strengths as a model, and each of those have limitations, and not every, not one of those model is going to solve every training question or problem or idea that you have. And so a, a bigger picture sense, we can talk about specific variables, but that the overarching principle is we want to be able to develop looking across that whole speed through endurance continuum when we're making training judgments. Um, because often what I've seen in some of these visits is you have, you know, physiology maybe test that aerobic piece over here, and you maybe have strength and conditioning that test the speed power piece. And those two things aren't necessarily talking to each other. And different decisions get made based on those two things. And actually having that conversation together and making those judgments along that whole continuum together is where I think you get the most bang for buck and where you leave least on the table with individual athletes. So you mentioned the ability to create subgroups. And I think that was in the, yes. in the mention about about yep. Phil and his, his work with England cricket. Can you explain that a little bit more for us? Yeah, yeah. So what 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 the model-based framework I just talked through, so say let's say, you know, I use um, a five-zone training model for my athletes to improve them, and I put everyone through that five-zone model. There are some athletes that are probably going to respond better to that and some where it's really just not going to work for them at all. Now, one of the reasons I think that it doesn't work for some people is that these models are, let's say, suited towards endurance type profiles, so more slow twitch type athletes. And when you think about, again, at the beginning, we talked about the distribution of the literature being predominantly on the aerobic side. A lot of the training models 
kind of a bias in that direction. So a lot of the findings of, you know, this type of training is what works the best is based on a skewed reality where it, it's focused on that endurance side of the, the population. Now, then coaches have this complexity question, right? And you say, okay, well, this, this kind of model is working for some people, but it's not working for others. Now, what we can do at the front end before we've chosen our training model for an individual is go, what's the distribution in our group? And we can profile the anaerobic speed reserve as a first layer tool to go, okay, who's a bit more speed? Who's a bit more endurance? And then we have buckets, right? Along a continuum where we can maybe say, hey, this model that we're currently using might preferentially suit one third of the group of athletes that we've got. And, you know, it's it's a real accountability thing, I think, you know, like just coming back from the games, you realize you have a real responsibility as a practitioner to do everything you can for that athlete and they get one shot at this. And when I was in New Zealand, they had a population, you know, of four and a half million, right? So hardly anything. So if you find a talent, you better get everything right with that talent because you might not have another one for 10, 20 years. And so at the front end, before we've selected our model, before we've gone, okay, here's the training or cultural bias of how we develop athletes. If we can actually step back and have, I like the phrase, firm opinions loosely held, right? And, and go, what have we got in front of us? And then how do we, you know, how do we proceed on here based on where somebody is at? And so each sport is going to have, let's say, a ticket to the dance, right? There's going to be a minimum level of aerobic capability you need to be in a 1500 meter Olympic final. But guess what? Once you're on the start line, everyone also is in that same ballpark. And so there are things that you, Rob, would bring to the table that we want to maximize to make sure that can be your weapon in that kind of scenario. So it's not saying, hey, this person's speed-based, we only do speed stuff. You need to look at the individual first, profile the athlete, and then what are the demands of the sport that you're in, and then what are the goals of the athlete? And I realize at the elite level, that's probably a bit easier. If you're someone who's listening and you're working in the athlete development space, then a framework I like to think about with this is something called ABZ, which is um, a, an example one of the startup guys, Sean Puri, uses. And what he says is, you want to know where you are. That's number A, right? Letter A, where you are. So you can identify that with your profiling. Then you go, okay, what's your Z, right? Where are we trying to get to? You know, if you're if you're an 18 year old, say academy player, or you're, you know, what's the long term goal? Are you trying to be an Olympic finalist? Are you trying to get a scholarship at college? And each of those will create different types of demands of what you're trying to aim for. And then based on that, you can go, okay, now what's the next step? And that for for individuals, I think, is a much more uh, it gives it gives you a much greater chance of getting more hits right because you're zooming in on what that individual needs rather than here's a model which says okay on in five weeks time on a thursday at 2 p.m we're going to be doing this and i and i realize that it's uh it's easy to say harder to execute and there are realities for coaches that have 50 athletes to take care of but even if as a minimum you were able to do that first piece of hey, who have we got in front of us? And you could bucket your 50 group across that continuum. You could target each of those three groups with a more specific stimulus than going, here's a model. Let's put everyone through that. Have you seen any good examples? I'm guessing you have, and I probably know the answer already, but have you seen any really good examples of people who have got them constraints that you mentioned of large groups, Team sports, just because of the audience that listens to this podcast, probably sports scientists and the conditioning coaches who yep. are in them team sport environments. So any little anecdotes of how yep. 
successful organizations have, have implemented this kind of thing would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, I think probably a good, uh, I'm doing you a bit of a favor here, Rob, but I think probably <laughs> the episode you did with um, with Ben Rosenblatt and Martin yes. Evans at the FA, um, that was a big collaborative work piece of work that I did with those guys for yeah, sort of an 18-month period uh, pre-pandemic. And they talked about in that episode how given that profiling, they were able to bring together the however many squads it is across the, a, the FA with, you know, different age groups, um, actually streamline that. So we're now all talking about the same kind of language, you know, in, in, in middle distance sense, I would talk about 400, 800 athletes and 800 athletes and 800, 1500 athletes, but they might talk about flyers and other things but using those same principles of what are the what's the diversity within a typical squad you know Bakayo Saka is very different to Phil Foden right who's very different to Harry Kane who's very different to Harry Maguire right and so you look at that and go okay what are the, what categories are we using to understand who we've got because typically in team sports it might be positionally Right, so we might say, here's all the centre backs, here's all the, you know, full backs, and that has pros and importance from a technical tactical point of view, but perhaps when it comes to physical conditioning, we can have diverse profiles within a position, and so that can mean with some athletes we're leaving a lot on the table, you know, where yeah maybe they're improving, but the question I'd ask is are they reaching their potential, which is ultimately the question. Mm-hmm. Just look at the centre backs using England as an example, like John Stones and Harry Maguire. Yeah, yeah. big contrast, big contrast. Yeah. So the, so the, how did that? <laughs> I was going to say sarcastically, how did that end up? That didn't go too bad, did it? With the uh, the FA leading to yeah. this, leading to this summer, did all right. Yeah. Completely, completely. Getting to the, yeah, to the final. Um, yeah, and I think it's you know at, at a certain level of um, you know the elite sport continuum, like individualizing and maximizing your own strengths becomes becomes the thing and you know one of you're asking about observations from the trip well the 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 most consistent successful squads i saw were people who were asking these kind of questions as part of their daily practice right they were daily questioning these things and it's a new season okay what are we going to do different this time we're at a different point in the river the limiting factors in our squad in our athletes have shifted what does that now mean and yeah when you first profile you know a squad depending on how much you've tapped out or trained those qualities um they are going to shift you know someone who's at one end might just be at one end because they've really under trained one of those two components but after you've after you've had you know, a period of time with people in a program, you will sort out very quickly what kind of diversity you've got. And a, a nice way of doing that without, if you if you don't have the tools to profile, we can talk about maybe how you do that easily in a second. But a very easy way to do it is, you know, what type of sessions does this athlete really enjoy? Or what are they good at? You know, and you might have two or three of those. And then which are the two or three that they really don't enjoy? Right. And and right now with a pen and paper, you could probably do that, right, with your squad. And I remember Phil did that before he actually did the uh speed reserve profiling of his group. And it was pretty good. Um in comparison. And and that's important too, because you know, no one test is gonna give you the whole picture. It's a starting point as a line in the sand for a discussion based on the question you're asking or the decision you're trying to make. And so that insight of observation that practitioners are having in the field, that coaches are having in the field, to map onto so a bit more objective is really the the magic formula, right? In, in in the end. And so yeah, that's a good process that people can go through very quickly, very easily. And a lot of people are capturing these measures of sprinting speed and some kind of aerobic test. Um, but it's about putting those together. And, and then creating those discussions with it. I'm going to bring bring you back to that when you said we'll just discuss that in a minute. And it was the easy, on the easy side of profile, the easy profiling, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Could you be able to keep, expand on that for us? 
Yeah, so for uh, in terms of equipment to, to measure these things, in an ideal world with sprinting speed, you would use a radar gun, but realize not everyone has that. <laughs> um, timing gates, also very useful. I would look at getting five meter splits at the back end of your 50 meter sprint. Um, and then you can estimate with speed over time to get your, um, sorry, speed is distance over time to get your estimate of maximal sprinting speed. Um, if you don't have timing gates, you could just get some cones out. If you have a stopwatch and a cone, you know, probably practice it a few times to test your reliability, but it's very accessible to get that. And then on the max aerobic speed side, I would typically use a six minute run. And I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll walk through that because I get a lot of questions about this and they're great questions and important questions. So let's, let, let's dive into it. Just before or, that, do you want to go somewhere else? Yeah. No, 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 we'll stay there. I'm just wondering okay. who these, who these questions come from mainly. Oh yeah. Across the map. Um, so team sports. Yeah. Team sport, okay. conditioning coaches. Okay. Um, yeah, people, you know, from sports like lacrosse to football, sorry, English football, yeah. uh, soccer. Um, yeah, all, all over the map. So um, Carry on. Sorry, I interrupted you there. Yeah, that's okay. So when I think about testing, I'm thinking about what decision do I want to try and make at the end? And what question are we trying to answer? So if we take, if we say, for example, that I want to test for aerobic fitness, let's say. And maximal aerobic speed is the marker we've used in our program. If I'm now thinking about a test that I want to select, you know, I'm thinking about, I want a, a test with high signal, right? And low noise. So if my aim is aerobic fitness, that's the primary thing I'm trying to measure. So if I then introduce a change of direction in that test, which includes an acceleration and a deceleration. If I include a rest period in that test, which has implications for different recovery kinetics between individuals, both from a, a ventilation breathing side of things, but also what's going on in the muscle, I'm every time I add another one of these factors to the test, I'm creating more noise. And so the thing that I originally wanted to look at and make a decision about, which was aerobic fitness, I'm now adding more and more variables. So when I retest and someone improves, did they improve because their change of direction was better? They were better at accelerating or decelerating, could be one of those. Or is it better because we've got some peripheral adaptation and the muscle can better uh, recover from that that what high intensity effort or is it because aerobically the training we did worked and we got you know fitter from that and if we're honest i can't answer that question clearly now i understand there's this there's this tension between sport specific nature of a test and sport specific training which we can get to in a second but sport specific testing I think it really comes down to what are you trying to make a decision about? Because in that scenario I just walked through, it's very hard to go, yeah, we did this block of aerobic work and it moved the needle. Well, did it? Is that what moved the needle? Or was it you're now better at decelerating because of because you listened to what Damien's been talking about, right? And you've been doing that, that kind of work. And so... The signal to noise principle, I think, is really central to this question. Um, we talked about critical speed before, and I'll just touch on this because the principle of critical speed is really important for people. Um, from a physiological term, like I get a lot of questions from academics. Why don't we use critical speed at the bottom of the anaerobic speed reserve in terms of maximal aerobic speed? So I'll just tackle that. <laughs> uh, quickly. So what critical speed is, is it's the last intensity where the body f from a fuel perspective is primarily relying on almost exclusively the aerobic system to deliver that performance. And in a highly trained endurance athlete, so um, middle distance runner, uh, 10K runner, 
you could sustain that intensity for 40 to 60 minutes. So for things like the half marathon, the 10K, uh, the marathon, really, really important central variables to training and, and improving aerobic fitness. And the reason that's important is if you can raise that intensity, it essentially delays the chaos that goes on at a muscle level uh, to a faster, to a harder intensity, right? So a big aim of training is to raise that, that speed to push that further, right? And, and then build out from that speed your durability at that pace. So that's one of the big aims of endurance training. The challenge with implementing critical speed testing in runners, first of all, and then we can talk about team sports, is that a, a critical speed model requires a, a, a two or three minute all out effort and a, and a all out 12 minute effort. Delightful. Now, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, there is a three minute all out test, but there are reliability issues with, with some of those things. And, and to be honest, like implementation of even just that, a three minute all out effort, that's like a race. And you are, to, to, to use that test, you are blowing a hole in someone's training week. And so, again, when it comes back to what decision are we trying to make, that test really has to stand up as being like the most valuable thing in about a 10-day block of training for you to implement it. For the 2 and 12-minute scenario, there are maybe, I'm going to say, less than five world-class runners who could run you a reliable 2-minute all-out effort and 12-minute all-out effort. You know, people like Laura Muir, who are strong at 800, 1500, the mile, 3K, 5K, or Sifan Hassan, but there are not many more. And so that really brings a big implementation problem. And so the principle of critical speed is, is important from the fitness point of view I talked about, but the testing of it is very challenging. So what I tend to do is I use maximal aerobic speed in the field, a six minute effort, which might equate in, uh, to about a 2K time trial. And in our, in our group here in Victoria, we've run both. We have speed of VO2 max in the lab and 2K time trial in the field, and it's pretty much one for one. Back in my PhD, I did the same, but used a 1500 meters, which was a race um, with Aussie and New Zealand athletes. And 1500 was a bit too short of distance, which was in the three, four minute mark. Um, so what I use with that six minute is I then go, okay, critical speed or the lactate threshold would typically be at, um, you know, if you're looking at the second inflection on a lactate curve, which is approximately, not exactly, but approximately similar to the critical speed, um, you would get that typically in an endurance athlete, 85 to 93% of that maximal aerobic speed. So in a team sport athlete where the durability of those paces is not going to be as high because it's not such an important training aim, that percentage is going to be slightly lower, probably in the 75 to 80%. But what that also means is there's some headroom to push that up. So when we're doing testing with our, our team sport athletes for aerobic purposes, yes, MAS is a the thing we measure, but we're using that for two purposes. One, to be able to prescribe sessions around MAS, but also understand where approximately that critical speed is going to sit underneath it. And then we can use both of those as training zone stimulus with our, our athletes. And then when you put a subgroup lens on top of that, the more endurance-based athletes within your group, that side of things, the critical speed particularly, is like bread and butter for those guys. That's how you get... So you look at, again, we're talking about the England football team, but let's stay there. So someone like a Jordan Henderson or a James Milner, very, very different type of athlete to a Bakayo Saka or a Raheem Sterling. You know, so someone like a Bakayo Saka, you give him tons of um, that kind of long efforts at critical speed, that would break someone like that. It's too much of a stimulus from, from a number of angles. Let's come back to that. But for, for your more aerobic, run-all-day type athlete, that kind of stuff is really going to maximize the aerobic qualities that they have. Whereas 
the more speed endurance, harder anaerobic stuff probably flattens them a bit. Because if you look at it from a um, muscle physiology perspective, if they're more slow twitch as an athlete, their muscle machinery is built to work more aerobically. That's their preference, right? So you want to maximize that type of system in that type of athlete. Whereas you start doing lots of hard anaerobic stuff with that type of athlete, they don't have the same glycolytic capability at a muscle level to cope with that. And so it can fatigue and flatten more. So in those type of athletes, you really want to build that aerobic side of things. And then maybe sprinkle some of those other things. Um, Again, so I'll, I'll maybe just pause there. That was a lot. No, 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 no. That's great. No, mate, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you roll. This is fantastic. You said you were going to come back to the soccer. Yeah. So, point. so if you take if you, if you take someone like a Bukayo Saka, you put them in that same situation. The principle of critical speed is still important because there's a minimum kind of aerobic demand that you need to be able to handle ninety minutes three times a week. You know, well, Arsenal aren't quite in Europe at the moment, but that's a that's a whole other whole quite other way. Sport. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you know, if you're a top four team and you're playing three times a week, you do have to have that minimum level of aerobic stimulus. The question is, how do you get there? The principle is still important, but you get there differently. And this is where moving back from here's my training model and going, who have I got in front of me? You can then be more specific in how you apply that critical speed principle to that speed based athlete so someone in that speed-based uh, profile so these are the athletes that would have a slightly lower maximal aerobic speed and a, probably a very fast maximal sprinting speed and probably in team sport athletes it would be very similar to middle distance so probably around that 10 meters a second sprinting speed would be what i would consider a speed type athlete as you move down the more endurance type athletes might only have you know a low 9.0 meters per second maximal sprinting speed but there are so they're going to have a smaller speed reserve but their aerobic is going to be very strong so that that's that's how i would differentiate those two um so the repeated sprint angle and the interval based approach is how i would tackle developing those aerobic qualities in those athletes and there's a few reasons for that you know a lot of the research would say okay to build aerobically and improve someone's aerobic fitness you've got to accumulate time at vo2 max let's say but the challenge is with that is that if you're metabolically more fast twitch, um, things become very anaerobic very, very quickly. And so the stimulus that was intended to be primarily aerobic actually isn't. And so there are recovery implications for that. And there's enjoyment implications of that. And you just can't get the type of volume you want to maximize that stimulus. And instead, it tends to flatten people and overcook people and there's some really nice work out of Belgium that has shown this on a longitudinal basis where they took more fast twitch athletes and more slow twitch athletes and they put them through some overreaching protocol where they basically smash people for 10 days right double training volume that kind of thing and what they found was the fast twitch uh, athletes really overreached quickly but the more endurance based athletes the slow twitch athletes could handle it a bit more so this again is where like from a subgroup lens it just make you make different decisions about who's in front of you about each session stimulus um, because you're looking at it through how can that type of individual handle it so repeated sprint training or interval training allows you to run at a faster speed which is more mechanically in their wheelhouse. Um, you find if speed-based athletes are plodding, let's say, slow jogging, actually perceived exertion can be really high. It can be very uncomfortable. You know, back when I started out looking at this diversity of populations, because that was typically how physiology would do it, we just had a look at what if we run a normal sort of submaximal test with this athlete and like lactate's high from the beginning, ventilation is high from the beginning, the data is a mess because everything's just high and there's not value to me as a practitioner making a decision about this athlete aerobically off the classic methods. Whereas the interval-based approach, you can cap the amount of anaerobic stimulus that's generating through duration of the repetition. And you're not looking to get faster, you're just looking to build volume. So you might do... 
for example, um, say on a, on a track, but you can easily convert this to a pitch or field. You know, you might look at doing, you know, 200s at 16 second pace, let's say, and you calculate these speeds based on how your max aerobic te speed test came out and your critical speed as an estimate from there came out. And you might just looking at building up the volume of the number of those that you can do. And the aim isn't to get faster, the aim is to build volume. That is still aerobically moving the needle for those speed types of athletes. It's just different to the classic go and run for 20 minutes. Now, if you've got, you know, Jordan Henderson or these, you know, more endurance-based runners, I would actually consider taking a leaf more out of some of the middle distance training philosophy of, you asked me about tempo runs, Rob, in one of your questions. Now we can define that uh, in a second, but in the, in the distance running world, tempo run would essentially mean a workout that's aiming to work in and around that critical speed landmark and people would tend to start maybe in the six to eight minute repetition range length and build that out so you know someone who's a 30 year old 10 years of training they might be able to do 20 to 30 minutes straight as a tempo at that pace that's highly highly trained and then you kind of just work back from there based on where someone is today um and so using that principle of tempo I would be looking at how can I sneak that into my week with those type of athletes? Because I realize conditioning coaches might have 15 minutes in a warm up. And a great application of this is um, you may remember Jessica Ennis, who won Hiptathlon Gold at the London Olympics, worked very closely with Steve Ingham. And I remember Steve telling me a story about how with Jess, you know, they had this challenge of you got seven events, a lot of them speed power, you know, in the heptathlon, you got high jump, long jump, 200 meters, 110 hurdles, a couple of throws and an 800 at the end. And the 800 leading into London was letting her down. So the question from the coach was, how do we improve aerobically without taking away from the high jump? without taking away from the long jump. It's the same question that team sports are asking, Absolutely. that middle distance coaches and, uh, are asking, right? What they did was taking this principle of critical speed was every day for a warm up, Jess would do some kind of plodding jog, right? And she didn't particularly enjoy it, but it was a warm up, right? And what they did over time was they actually just picked up the pace of that a little bit. So that actually it was nearer the kind of critical speed type effort. And it wasn't starting out trying to be a hero, trying to do 30 minutes a day. You haven't done it before. It's a new stimulus. Um, but what they did do was try and do two minutes a day and then three minutes a day and then four and work up to five. And all of a sudden across a week, you've accumulated, you know, 20 to 35 minutes at that pace, which sort of microdosing it like that um, over time compounds, right? And builds aerobic adaptation. And then when you retest and you look at where the maximal aerobic speed is and you can judge those sessions of critical speed based on how someone's breathing. You know, when we do those tests with our endurance runners, yeah, we use the lab to test those landmarks or we use a key training session to see where you're at. But when we test that pace in the field, I'm on a bike with the athletes listening to how they're breathing. If breathing sounding like it's getting out of control, they're working too hard, you know, because they've moved beyond that sustainable pace. It's too hard. And then we might use lactate to check in. So there's lots of things that once you've got that initial landmark with your profiling, you can then in the field do those tests of what does this sound like? You know, are they working too hard or, or not hard enough? You know, and if they're not working hard enough and it's the pace you had before, well, they that's that's information and they've improved and you can push that that needle a bit more. So that's how I would think about implementing that aerobic conditioning in a team sport setting.